We are rolling, and... Wait, can you hear me? I can hear you now. The hell? All right, there's going to be a lot more cursing in this episode than normal, I think. Yeah? Well, good. I've heard that brings the ratings up. We have ratings? No. Right now we've got... <laughs> you just held up a hand. Guess how many fingers he held up? Listeners? Or, I'm sorry, I guess I should say listener. Yes. Pete Nixon, you're listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your hosts, Big Anklevich. It's because of men like you that all must be destroyed. Headstrong, violent. And Brish Outfield. You see? You see? Your stupid minds. Stupid. Stupid. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. I am Big Anklevich. And I'm Player Two, Rish Outfield. Ready, Player Two. Um, welcome. This is uh, our first episode in 2015? Probably. I, I tend to say that a lot, guys. I know, but it feels like it's been a long time since we did an episode, so. But here we are. We're in it for the long haul, folks, today. That's right. We're not going away, whether you want us to or not. Oh, and they so want us to go away. <laughs> they won't listen to that gets my goat. And then they say, well, hey, well, how come you guys don't podcast anymore? So, yeah, there, there have been six that gets my goats, kid. These are the jokes, kid. Uh, I was the bull. <laughs> All right, so today we've got a story from you. It's a triple word score contest story by a returning author. One of your favorites. Wait, are you talking to the audience or are you talking to me? Uh, yes. So, so he's one of my favorite authors. It's one that you look forward to more than some other authors. Okay. I don't know really. To that does narrow truth. it. I have no idea where he sits in your favorites. He's been on our show several times. He's won a few of our contests in the past. And uh, his name is J.M. Perkins. Yes, you're right. You might know him from his Chemo series. I actually have Chemo, How I Learned to Kill, right here on my bookshelf. Pow. Well, wow, it's the one soft cover book you have on your <laughs> bookshelf. That, that that's kind of says a lot. Like, I don't believe in soft cover books. Except for Chemo. That's right. How I Learned to Kill Rish Outfield. Wait, what? So yeah, he's been on here doing chemo stories a few times we've had in the past. How many stories would you say he's done on the show then? Uh, he's been on here at least three times. So this is number four? Yeah. Oh, This, excellent. I think, is his first non-chemo story on the, on the show, though. This is, this is a little different, which I guess kind of comes with the territory of the uh, triple word score because, you know, you just get three random words. And you have to work them into a story somehow. Yeah. Which, it's hard to just shove that into the format that you always do. Yeah, this time around, he's got a superhero story for us. Okay. The story is called Field Exercise. I say let's not spoil the three words on this one until the authors know. Is that okay? Okay, we can do that. Because one of them is Kung Pao Shrimp, right? Yeah, I think so. Uh, okay, well, we won't spoil the story. We won't spoil the words. We're just going to go ahead and have the story uh, air or cast. Whatever Play. you say about a podcast. Play is a good word. Good, good word. Yeah, we'll go with that. Field Exercise by J.M. Perkins. Player one. Player two. Prepare yourself. Round one. Three. Two. One. Fight. Where'd you go, my little crustacean? Asked the gimp aloud, senses probing the grimy alley. Of course, in the skin-tight, latex-wrapped Kevlar of his costume, the words came out as an indiscernible muffle. <laughs> Hooded, gimp felt rather than heard the superhero's battle cry. Kung Pao Punch! In the shifting shadows, Gimp smiled beneath his suit. The idiot telegraphed his attack the same way every time. A good thing, too. With super strength that persisted even when he shrank, the shrimp could do some serious damage if he ever found two neurons to rub together. 
Gimp dodged the orange blur of the diminutive metahuman centimeter long fist, ducked, rolled, and counterattacked. Everything went silent. The shadows around Gimp grew, solidified, became thick, wet sheets of nearly unbreakable something. They wrapped themselves around Kung Pao Shrimp, squeezed tight. A small voice squeaked, You're killing me! Underneath his bodysuit, the Gimp smiled and said, That's the idea. <laughs> the lights came on, dispelling the shadows, and from the wall speaker, Power King announced, Okay, that's enough. Pack it in, boys. You're done. The alley scene melted back into the bare surfaces of the default danger dome. Gimp unzipped and threw back his hood to reveal the angry teenage face beneath. What the hell, man? Why'd you have to screw this up for me? He said to Kung Pao Shrimp. Me? Said Kung Pao Shrimp, touching the flaming shrimp decal on his chest and growing back to his full size. You're the one who started acting like some kind of a villain. Before the gimp could respond, Power King's voice crackled back on the PA. Ryan Matthews, Victor Wen, out of your costumes and in my office now. Victor Wen grumbled as he pulled off his sweaty gimp suit and stepped into civvy clothes. Power King sat behind an overlarge desk, steepling his fingers. His power armor was in its standby mode, crown retracted and helmet spread open to show serious brown eyes set deep in a lined middle-aged face. The veteran hero looked back and forth between the two apprentice superheroes, saying nothing. Finally, he sighed. <sighs> what am I going to do with you? Look, it wasn't my fault. Victor said before a lifted finger from Power King silenced him as effectively as if he'd been engulfed in his own shadows. Let's review, shall we? Despite powers that others would kill for, despite excellent test scores, the pair of you can't work with each other. Hell, you can't work with anyone. Yet, somehow, you still expect me to sign off on your petition for inclusion in field exercises for next week. Ryan looked at his feet. You're right, Power King. We'll try harder. Hey! Victor said. I don't want to partner with this idiot anyway. There's no we. I won the fight. Power King snorted. Huh. Yeah, and you almost killed your sparring partner. Like it or not, he's your partner, Victor. Even if you are sparring, if and when you are cleared for field work, you can opt to solo, but not before. Victor looked at the floor. And seriously? Your costume is a gym suit? I don't even... What? What? Why? Even if you can sense through the shadows, how are you supposed to work as part of a team if you can't even talk? The teenager huffed. Uh, I block out vision and hearing, and I'm an umbra kinetic. What the hell was I supposed to call myself? Shade choker? Ryan snorted. Power King turned to him. Your persona is nearly as ridiculous, Kung Pao Shrimp. Ryan folded his arms over his chest. I told you, I got my amazing power to shrink to prawn size while maintaining my super-powered Kung Pao strength after I ate an enchanted plate of shrimp. Power King sighed. <sighs> Look, the costumes aren't even the issue. I'll let the PR department handle that if and when you graduate. My job is to make sure you're fit for duty. Now, you both can utilize your powers, I'll give you that. But one of you seems to have gotten his tactics out of comic books. Bad comic books from the 40s. Victor snickered, <laughs> and Power King turned his attention to him. While the other is an angry goth who can't work with anyone. Field exercises are next week, and neither of you is cleared. Oh, oh, come, come on. on! They shouted in unison. You're nowhere near ready. In fact, I'm advising the membership committee that... The alarm blared out. The building rumbled as something or someone breached the citadel's walls. Ryan held onto his chair to keep from falling to the ground. Power King's electronic armor clicked into place to cover his face, his hypersonic crown spinning up to charge his suit. The indicators on his chest glowed red and blue. Stay here, he ordered, 
his inhuman digitized voice issuing from the speakers embedded near his shoulder. What's going on? Ryan asked, Power King already moving out of his office. When he reached the threshold, he turned back to the apprentices, repeated, Just. Stay. Here. Before rocket boosting and disappearing down the hallway. His trainer out of sight, Victor pulled and stretched his gimp costume, hopping and twisting to get the skin-tight suit on. His brow furrowed, Ryan said, Victor, Gimp, we're supposed to stay here. Shrugging on his hood, Gimp left without a word. Ryan sighed, donned his orange domino mask and chased after. From far away, crashes and booms shook the floor. Victor didn't have to walk long before he found Power King. All around, tracks of fluorescent bulbs flickered, died. A large gaping hole in the wall revealed the well-tended grounds outside the citadel. Gimp didn't see any of this from beneath the black latex that covered his face. Instead, he felt the angles of the shadows that caught the rubble, each one of them bubbling with possibility, with power. He smiled. He'd finally get a chance to show that pompous old windbag what he was capable of when he wasn't sparring with an idiot. Gimp stepped through a shattered blast corridor. Up ahead, the supervillain Capybara held Power King up in an impact crater smashed into a reinforced steel wall. PK's armor had broken in a thousand ways. Half his face poked through his shattered helmet. Where is she? Capybara growled. Where's my daughter? Okay, Victor. Gimp thought to himself. You only get one shot. You got this. He flexed the tiny shadows around Capybara's nose, cutting off the villain's vision and hearing in solidified, freezing blackness. From the floor, more pools of darkness rose and reached for the raging mass of hair and muscle. Half through his speakers, half through his mouth, Power King screamed. Vict! Gimp! No! You're not ready! Get out of here! Gimp said. I got him! The shadows surged up, but Capybara flipped, avoiding them. He landed on Victor, striking his heels down with enough force to knock the wind from the apprentice's lungs. Gimp struggled to breathe beneath his costume, his focus breaking and his command of the shadows slipping away. Capybara blinked, his eyes and ears unclouding. Cute, but I could still smell you. The villain hoisted Gimp. All right, Power King, playtime's over. Give her back to me or I'll rip apart the kid. Power King fired his last <laughs> missile, exploding it off of Capybara's thick skull. <sighs> the beast man snarled, dropped Gimp, and ran towards Power King. Ryan, hiding behind some rubble that had fallen from the ceiling, decided it was now or never. What would Victor do? He thought to himself. He leapt up, a tiny orange blur, and caught Capybara in the middle. Capybara grunted, stumbling and smashing into the wall to the left. He swung his claws through the air, trying to catch his bee-sized attacker. But Ryan had already scurried beneath a piece of fallen ceiling tile. Capybara sniffed at the air and licked his lips, smiled with each of his sharpened teeth. Not a bad punch for a little guy. But you need to understand, small fry, we're in different leagues. He brought his foot up over where Kung Pao Shrimp hid. <coughs> the gimp said. Capybara brought his hind paw down, striking through the floor as Ryan jumped out of the way. What? Asked Kung Pao Shrimp, screaming to be heard in his miniaturized state. He rolled out of the way of a kick that would have splattered him against the wall. Gimp unzipped the back of his costume, pulled its hood down to free his mouth. Wheezing to catch his breath, he said, The nose! Hit him in the nose! Kung Pao Shrimp put all he had into one more attack, his orange never before burning quite so bright. His tiny fist connected with Capybara's nose with an audible crunch. Capybara howled, blood dribbling down into the thick fur of his face. He snatched Kung Pao Shrimp out of the air before the hero could hide again. He squeezed, and Ryan felt his ribs begin to give. I'll fucking pop you! Capybara snarled. Victor focused, his shadows once again stealing the world away from Capybara. The villain thrashed, cursing as his taloned paws tore into the wall. But this time, shadows wrapped around him. Kung Pao Shrimp squirmed, 
growing back to his original size and freeing himself just as the darkness had enveloped Capybara. Blackness like ice-encrusted iron constricted, tightened, the vague shape of Capybara choking beneath it. The supervillain went still, but still the shadows pressed down. <clears throat> Son of a... Ugh! Victor, no, don't! Ryan said, clutching at his broken ribs. Resisting all his instincts, Victor let the shadows loosen, withdraw from the villain's mouth and nose. He slumped against a wall, exhausted. Crisis averted, Ryan moved over to a groaning power king. A pained smile on his face, the trainer teased. <sighs> I thought I told you to stay put. Well, I could just leave you here... Ryan teased back, the first time he'd ever risked doing so with a superior. Tell you what, you get me to an auto dock in the infirmary, and I'll forget you disregarded a direct order. Hell, I'll even sign off on field exercises next week. You two have earned it. Deal, Ryan said, hoisting Power King and helping him limp towards the hallway. Victor stood, falling in step beside Ryan. Thick shadows dragged Capybara along behind them. After a moment, Ryan said, I thought you were going to kill him. Yeah, well, I just thought, what would Kung Pao Shrimp do? And eased off. Victor smiled. I thought something similar. Ryan smiled back. You know, Power King probably has a point. I should probably rethink the whole gimp thing. What do you think about... Penumbra. Nice, Ryan said, flashing a thumbs up with his free hand. I'm thinking about going for a rename myself. What do you think about Mighty Might? Uh... Victor said, shaking his hand back and forth to emphasize the sentiment. You know, I kind of like Kung Pao Shrimp. It's colorful. Ryan laughed, then rubbed the back of his head and looked at the wall. <laughs> hey, Git, I mean, Penumbra, I know you said you wanted to work alone and all, but we made a good team today. And I was just thinking, you know, that we could stay partners if you wanted. Not that you have to or anything. I'd like that. Victor said, extending a hand. Partner. Ryan shook it, jouncing Power King. The instructor winced. Hey, guys. How about a little less bonding and a little more getting the injured superhero legend to medical attention? They walked in silence, the apprentices finally looking forward to next week's field exercises. Player one. Player two. You win. Game over. Thank you for your story. Wait, you need to do it because that voice sounded a lot more like you. Go. I, it didn't sound like me. What was that? Hey, did we ever figure out who produced this episode? We did, yeah. We, we hired a private detective and we figured it out. And the same guy who always produces it. Come on, Justin Charles produced it, of course. We should have Justin Charles on the show every week. We do, in a way. <laughs> okay, I hear you. Um... <laughs> Usually we, on these triple word scores, well, we didn't even tell people what the triple word score story rules are. Is that okay? Do you think people, anybody was like, uh, I, uh, I did, it. did say that you had three random words. Oh, you did? So, okay. I figured That's we'd all... skip the full on like rule you thing. Agreed. The only other rule was that it had to be 2,000 words or less. Yes. So, there you go. Do we have a cast list for this story, Richard Field? I, I don't believe so, but we could probably compile one. Okay, so this was something that we recorded at the New Media This is something that we recorded at the New Media Expo. Uh, so voices, I heard you in there. I was in there. I think you were Paste Pot Pete. No, <laughs> sorry. I think you were Kung Pao Shrimp. Yes. I heard me in there. I think I was the Gimp. Bring out the Gimp. Uh huh. I don't know who I played in the story, but uh, <laughs> I heard Marshall Latham as the 
Clock King, who was he? The... <laughs> That's one we don't mention later on in the show. He was the Power King, I think was his name. Okay. And Capybara was Brian Lincoln. Right. Is there somebody I'm missing? Well, there, there were no more other... There, there was no a more narrator. Who was the narrator? He, the, he did not sound familiar to he me. He didn't sound familiar? His name was Johnny Feisty. You just made that up. There, I, there ain't no narrator like that. <laughs> yeah, Johnny Feisty, who we met for the first time at the New Media Expo last year. What, he was in our barbecue sketch a few weeks ago. Or okay. A few, a few episodes ago, I should say, because the weeks don't really correlate. Not anymore. <laughs> so that was our cast. The only person we were missing was Dave Thompson, who I think had already gone home by then. But who would he have played? I don't know. I guess nobody. I'm just saying he was the sixth dude at the Sausage Fest. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but there was also uh, Renee and Abby at the New Media Expo, but, you know, they weren't dudes. Last time I checked, no. So it doesn't really correlate. Wait, I used that word already. I need to vary my vocabulary a little. Does not compute. No, that's no good either. I'm just going to end this segment and we're going to move on before it gets any worse. Is this really what you guys want to be talking about tonight? Is he here? <laughs> Apparently so. Hey, go have a smoke or something, man. It's not helping. <laughs> That's it. I'm out of here. But another thing about these triple word score stories is we'll always ask the author a couple of questions. And uh, in every case... So far, they've always answered the questions. Did uh, Jam Perkins answer them? He did. Yep, I've got him here. But before we go to that, I am going to finally spoil the surprise. The three words that J.M. Perkins had for his story were... Gimp. Bring out the gimp. Kung Pao Shrimp. Bring out the gimp. And King. Bring out the gimp. Huh. I, I remember when we drew that, we were hoping that the third word would rhyme. Because it was gimp. <laughs> Shrimp and chimp. Yeah, chimp would have been on. Oh, pimp. But anyway. Limp. Uh, yeah, it's just one of those weird things. I, Wimp. It's been so long since we did this drawing for the three words that... Uh, I mean, it wasn't even this house when we did it. That's true. And you've been here over a year. Yeah. But that part, that was so much fun doing the drawing for the words that it makes me want to do the contest again. But then we'd have to go through all this again. <laughs> But boy, this was this was a fun story. He he took the three words and made superhero characters out of each one. That's right. And yeah. I, I don't know. That's pretty brilliant. But you know, I, I'm a big fan of the whole superhero genre, and it seems like the whole world is right now, with the amount of money the movies have been raking in, and there is a very vocal segment of the population that is sick to death of the superhero <laughs> genre but yeah i mean you can do so many different things this is one of those school for superhero kind of stories and you know teenagers and finding their place in the world you know likening it to, to high school and all that i i, I dig it and uh, i really dug this story do you want to talk about the story or should we ask well, let's JM do let's do his thinks? questions first and then we'll talk about the story how's that sound all right okay uh so this is for uh, dr perkins Number one, was this a fun contest for you? Is writing generally fun to do anyway? And how did the rules of this contest make it more or less enjoyable for you? Yes. Wait, let me get, see if I can get a good J.M. Perkins voice here. Yes. This contest was... What do you think? Is that good? Say, uh, somebody was hiding... Must somebody be, must be hiding around here. Okay, there you go. Yes. The contest was fun for me. Riding is usually fun, but sometimes I get caught up chasing results, and then riding quickly becomes not fun. The rules of the contest were great because they gave me permission to fail. And that kind of it's okay if this doesn't work sensibility is so important to making art. If you know what I'm saying, <laughs> motherfucker. Yeah, I say, come on, baby, give me some love. Come on, baby. You know you like it. <laughs> Question I'm number two. J.M. Perkins. <laughs> I'm one sexy mother. Hey, shut your mouth. I'm talking about J.M. Perkins. Oh, okay, well that, that makes sense. Right <laughs> uh, question two. You were given three words at random. 
Uh, how much impact did the three words have on the finished product? How did you decide in what way to use the words? This story is entirely a product of the word choice. When I hit a wall with how gimp, bring out the gimp, kung pao shrimp, and king could possibly fit together, I figured I'd take the easy way out and just make them into superheroes. Since the gimp and kung pao shrimp are two of the lamest superhero names I could imagine, they ended up being trainees. The rest came after that, baby. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> All right, question yeah. number three. Who is your favorite doctor, sir? Only the single greatest time traveling doctor ever, Doc Brown. Lovely. I think <laughs> I've made it clear what I think of this story. How about you, Big Anklevich? What is your thought? I did really enjoy this uh, this story. I, I like that idea of the, the, the whole school for superheroes, the training... You know, the superheroes being like trainees learning to, to get along. Um, I really enjoy the X-Men has always been one of my favorite superheroes. So they probably are my favorite. They're the ones that kind of drew me into superheroes in the first place. And they were, when it comes down to it, the first of the movies that we got. I mean, people say, oh no, it was Blade. Batman. Superman. Batman. What? No, I'm talking about the now ones. A, the wave of present superhero movies. The current wave, especially of Marvel movies, started with the X-Men in uh, 2000, right? It was 2000. But wouldn't you say the current wave started with Iron Man in 2008? No, because X-Men and Spider-Man built the platform that Iron Man is standing on. I know, but you are, as you are so want to remind me, like a stick poking a homeless man... That was 15 years ago. That yeah. was the lifetime of a dingo. And uh, okay. you just you delight in letting me know that I'm old. It was 15 <laughs> years ago when X-Men came out. True. But yeah, that was what got me. That's when I went from being the guy I was before to the guy I am now. That's when the downhill slope started. <laughs> what got me into uh, comic books and superheroes was the X-Men movie. And the X-Men movie is that. It's, it's a school for gifted and talented youngsters. These people are learning how to be adults while having something weird like that thrown on top of it. Which I think is really cool. It's kind of, I mean, it's like Harry Potter too, you know, which is school for wizards. And even... They did a, a comedy Disney movie. Sky High, you called mean? Called Sky really High, yeah. What Where, was the one with Tim Allen that was the same movie? Wasn't that one a you wish computer it animated one, though? Had Tim Allen and Courtney Cox, the really fat kid from the Cat in the Hat and the Santa Claus, uh, Spencer Breslin in it. Okay. I you don't, don't know what I'm talking about? I vaguely remember that there was such a movie, but I never saw it. Oh, there are times Mr. Data. And, yeah, I don't know. Sky High I thought was pretty good. It was. As far yeah. as that goes. You know, it was made for younger kids, so it was a little goofy. But I think that they did some really good things. My favorite part was that Wonder Woman was the principal of the school. Linda Carter. Yeah. Right, that's true. I'd forgotten about that. Seeing Linda Carter in anything is... <sighs> Oh, it's so nice. Even all these years later, I mean, holy cow. Wonder Woman was in the 70s. It is it's true. And it was well into the 2000s. And obviously, I, I'm guessing she's probably had work done to look that amazing 30 years later. But still, you can't get over your first love. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. I was going to say, do you think that uh, Warner Brothers will find some way to, to fit... Linda Carter into their Wonder Woman movie, and then no. it's just like, wait a minute, no. Of course not. These are people who are even more ashamed of the source material than, or their legacy than Marvel Studios are, and that sounded like a criticism of Marvel Studios. I'm getting old. Yeah. But to throw Joss Whedon under the bus like that, i got to say, well, I'm going to side with Joss any time. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, the, the Sky High was pretty good, too. You know, it was fun. His dad was... Uh, Kurt Russell, if I remember right. Oh, that's right. He 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 was like a late bloomer. His power hadn't yeah. developed, and they there was like a certain amount of of time they would give you, and if 
your power didn't develop by then, then you were sent to like a normie school where all the... No, he, he became a sidekick was the problem. Oh, that's what it was. Okay. You either, you get on the two tracks. You're the hero track or the sidekick track, depending on how awesome your power is. And his power hadn't appeared yet. But he was the child of like the two greatest heroes. There's like the, the super strong hero and then the flying hero were his two parents. And so everybody expected him to be super awesome. And then he basically had no power as far as he knew. And so, so yeah, I thought that was a fun movie. And my kids always really enjoyed it, which is, uh, means that I saw it several times. I don't know. I like that idea. It's something that uh, I think is cool. Well, I see. I always wanted them to make a real X-Men movie where they were teenagers and they learned to socialize and have their powers and, and all that stuff, you know, hoping that they'd do like a New Mutant series or something like that, but you know. Yeah, we still haven't had that really, huh? Well, I guess there was X-Men First Class. That's the closest we'll probably ever that get. That was supposed to be it, but that wasn't really it. They weren't teenagers and had to deal with... You know that the girl that plays Caitlin Snow on, on Flash was the main girl on Sky High, right? Yeah, his love Daniel interest. Daniel Pan Baker. No, I, the love interest was Mary Elizabeth Winstead. That was the first time I saw her in anything. Wait, hold on a sec. The one that turned out to be like the arch enemy of the parents but reverted back to youth. Right, but I, oh, I was thinking that she was the, what, she the real love legitimate love interest. Well, okay. She was like his best friend and stuff. And then the one who like was the older one that stole him away was what was her name you just said? I said Mary Elizabeth Winstead, but I... Could be wrong. Wouldn't uh, wouldn't be me if I no, were. You but. were right. Here she is. So yeah, I like the story. Um, I really enjoy this idea, and I like the cheesiness of this story too. I love the gimp. We have the gimp. And the kung pao shrimp being yeah, that's a pretty awesomely awful superhero name, the kung pao shrimp. Right, but although it sounds like it could be a. a DreamWorks movie, you know, I mean, we could have, a, the Kung Pao Shrimp could be a character in the next Kung Fu Panda. Okay. <laughs> Doesn't make you happy. I well, think. see, yeah, no, I'm, I'm not a fan <laughs> of any of that stuff. Well, it's, you know, something that we complain, that I complain about, sorry, I'm not going to speak for you, on these triple word score stories is that they're never long enough. Uh -huh. They're always too short. This one felt like the perfect length. Like he maximized his use of every word that he had so it told the complete story, and what part of the story it didn't tell, we were supposed to just leave to our imagination or hope that we got to see these characters again. It was really an effective use of the canvas. Yeah, it definitely was that way. You didn't feel like, okay, it, it, the story just got started. You know, you actually had kind of a complete adventure, and you felt... It was the beginning of something, which right. I think was neat, and... You know, two characters that don't like each other, that work together and discover that each one has some kind of characteristic or strength that the other doesn't have and that they're better together than apart. I mean, that's what sports movies are about, unless it's a boxing movie, or that's what let put the band together movies are about, or, you know, a bunch of mercenaries that get put together on a team kind of movies are about. I, I, I just really like that. I mean, it's it's part of life is discovering teamwork and discovering that you have faults or you have uh, areas that you're not strong at and somebody else makes up for that. And so I dug that. And that's another thing about a team, you know, and a superhero team rather than just somebody by themselves. Right. When uh, Spider-Man joined the Avengers in the comics, it was just really neat to see the dynamic that he brought to the comics and, you know, being able to look at these guys and this guy is the super smart one and this is the guy is the super strong one and this guy is, you know, the funny one or the hothead or whatever kind of thing. And, and it's been fun to see that in going back to the, the Avengers, the Marvel Cinematic Universe, the strengths that each one of them has and the different situations in, in which one works best and one, one doesn't, you know, when you have people as varied as like a human being, which is what Hawkeye is, and a god, which is what Thor is, uh -huh. and that they could be on the same team, it shouldn't work. But in the hands of a very talented writer, it does work. I, you know, I, I like that, and I think that that's neat. You know, with somebody as lame as the Gimp, Bring out the gimp. his power is rad. The, right. the, power, the suffocating shadows or whatever, <laughs> that's cool, dude. And then, you know, Kung Pao Shrimp, I think... You know, in July, really shortly, we're going to see a movie with a character whose power set is almost exactly that. And uh, 
hopefully that'll be a lot of fun and people just really enjoy seeing, you know, the shrinking and getting bigger and having the, you know, the, somebody gets stronger, the smaller they get and all that. The smaller Ant-Man get, the stronger Ant-Man get. That sounded like Solomon Grundy talking. Oh, yeah. Well. Yeah, that, that'll be fun. I'm curious as to how people will respond to that one. That's, again, the risky one, but last year's risk turned out really well for Marvel with Guardians of the Galaxy, so... It's neat that they're willing to do a risky one. That it's not just sequel, sequel, sequel kind of thing. Yeah. They have tons and tons of sequels, don't get me wrong, but there's a chance that Ant-Man will be unsuccessful, that it won't make its money back, or that people will be like, ah, Ant-Man. Right, there is, and you never know. I mean... uh, One thing about Guardians of the Galaxy that was different was that it was like a space opera movie. You know, it was very different than the other superhero movies that we're talking about. Ant-Man is not so much that. You know, it's still set in our world. The guy's superpowers seem, you know, less conducive to awesomeness or something. So maybe people will be like, eh, why do I want to see a story about Ant-Man? Is it too late to change the name? But they could go with comedy. It sort of seems like they're going to go with comedy. It's hard to know based on a trailer because a trailer is meant to try and get the most people to go to a movie. And it's really rare that a trailer does anything but play it safe and just says, hey, kids, there's a movie coming out you need to see. But like Guardians of the Galaxy was so offbeat and weird and embraced its James Gunnianism that that was a must-see because of the trailer. I remember you making me watch that trailer, and you said this is the best trailer I've ever, I've seen in years or something like that. And I was like, dude, don't, don't oversell it. And then, yeah, I was just like, shoot, I want to watch that again. The marketing and, and also the brand recognition of Marvel Studios are what made Guardians of the Galaxy the hit that it was, and then, of course, word of mouth. And so I think... Ant-Man could do the same, although I don't think... Well, you saw the new trailer. Is its trailer as strong as... Does it make you say, oh, i got to see that opening day? I don't know if it's that way, but I'm not, I'm not that way anymore, you know? The only reason I saw Avengers opening day was because of Avengers 1, you know? I'm not a see it opening day person anymore. I guess I'm old, too old for that kind of stuff in general. Yeah, well, it was 15 years ago X-Men came out. Yeah, so a guy at work showed me the new trailer and we were mentioning about it. He's like, oh yeah, it seems like it should be a funny movie, but it also kind of feels like they're not going that way. And I'm like, well, they put funny things into the trailer, like the part where he says, eh, is it too late to change the name? Which is a funny bit. Right, but is that it's too? is it too late to change the name them being ashamed of the source material or is that legitimately them trying to get a laugh from the audience? I think it was them trying to get a laugh them trying to tell a joke and they have more jokes like that in this new trailer it kind of makes me think back to the Guardians of the Galaxy trailer where it's super heavy and awesome and oh this is awesome and then he's fighting the guy over his headphones for that hookah saka song and ah yeah which I would tell you also, I mean, another one, that's one of the other things that made that movie a hit is its soundtrack and the songs that they picked for it. My daughter listened to that soundtrack for like three months straight. But yeah, that kind of stuff that they put into it, you know, where he's just like, oh, yeah, no problem. Yeah, you, you have that. You know, just the little moments that they put into that trailer were uh, similar, I think, to some of the moments that they've got in the Ant-Man trailer. Inside. So yeah, this this uh, superhero story plays kind of right into that, I guess. We like to talk about movies, and especially superhero movies. But yeah, for the rest of the year, there isn't a whole lot of them, is there? There's fi- Fantastic Four and uh, Ant-Man, and that's pretty much it, huh? I think that's it for this year, yeah. And then there's the Star Wars movie, which is not, obviously, a superhero movie, but... But it could be a putting a bunch of people, disparate people, together... With the, they each have different skill sets, you know what I mean, in the same kind of way of, of you know a team building movie, introducing a bunch of people and they will become either a team or a family by the end of the movie. Right. That's certainly what the first Star Wars did. Uh huh. And I dig that. I, you, I, I love the how the 
team first got together stories and whenever people talk about you know origin stories being boring I, I love the first meeting between this guy and that guy and finding out even if you have to go in a flashback episode like on Firefly or whatever where you find out how they first met or how they first got together or how he first got the ship that sort of stuff really resonates with me I like to see how things begin and see the progression of you know this guy didn't used to like this guy at all and now they're best friends yeah do you think the new Star Wars movie might run into similar problems like Avengers had, where they have just too many main characters to try and service? Because they obviously have introduced a bunch of new ones yeah, that they, are going to carry the world on from here. They, they may have that problem, but we don't know any of these characters. We don't have a preconceived notion of how significant... And see, I don't... Even Marshall Latham knows the characters' names. I don't know their names. But, like, you know, who, Daisy Ridley's character from the trailer it looks like she's the lead or the co-lead in this new movie, but we don't know that. Maybe, you know, she becomes the, the lead in the next movie uh, and the leads are Han and, and Leia and Luke and, you know, Chewie and the droids in, that, in this movie. And, and I don't know. I mean, they, they've got to have something for each one of those guys to do that we already know and are invested in. Right. So it doesn't just feel like a glorified cameo, you know, Boba Fett looks at the camera. But yeah, if there are like seven or eight main characters and you have to find something that they're good at and a moment when they're useful and a moment when they shine and a moment when they have a, a line and each one has an arc, that seems like a tremendous job to do. But it might not be that. It might be, here's four guys and this is the last time we're ever going to see them. So we'll each give them one moment to say goodbye. And the rest of the movie is dedicated to these new three guys that you've never met before. You're going to find out who they are. They're going to get to know each other. They're going to carry the next three films or whatever. You know what I mean? Uh huh. And that to me doesn't seem nearly as difficult as, well, what can Black Widow do and what can Hawkeye do? And Quicksilver, oh my gosh, who's that? You know? Yeah, there is that. I mean, since these are all invented characters and they're not coming from comic books that we've been reading for 40 years, that does make things, I guess, a little bit easier. I, here's one more thing. Let's tie it back to field exercise. It was something that you like to talk about. When we were doing our Avengers, that gets my goat, which is still available. You talked about... Yeah, it's available now in a store near you. On uh, The Flash, the character of Cisco loves to give these villains these ridiculous names... I thought it would be fun if we talked about characters who have like really ridiculous powers or really worthless powers or worthless names. Or it's just like, oh, have you ever heard of this guy kind of thing? Okay. Um, because that seems to be some of the fun that John must have had when he was coming up with this book. This story is, okay, there's, if there's a guy named Kung Pao Shrimp, what, what his does he be? do? And it's like, okay, well, he has a Kung Pao punch. <laughs> it's like, okay, that's not lame enough or whatever i, I don't know just... <laughs> i mean the lame name that we talked about in the avengers that gets my goat still available is the bug-eyed bandit bug-eyed bandit clap which is apparently a long-standing villain in the dc universe they made it a woman in uh the flash show but i think it used to be a man oh okay but yeah it didn't really work for Flash because, first of all, this bandit was not a bandit. The, ba the bugs were not stealing anything. They were killing people. It was the bug-eyed murderer. But, but where do you get bug-eyed? She had created... They weren't even... She couldn't even control insects. These were little cybernetic... Yeah, they were robot bugs. Robot bugs, bugs that she I had think built and could She train. did have glasses. She had little, like, cat's eye kind of glasses. That she wore. Are you excusing this? No, I'm just... <laughs> it was terrible. It's the one of the worst names that I could think of. And I haven't read a lot of DC Comics, mainly because some of their stuff is pretty lame. My, I had a friend that used to work with me that would give me comic book trade paperbacks all the time. He was the guy who gave me, like, The Walking Dead trades for a long time. So I read, like, the first many years of that series but he gave me a dc like a justice league comic run that was called the identity crisis sure 
And in the identity crisis, two people with really lame names went at it. Apparently, somehow, part of the Justice League is a guy called Elongated Man. Yes. Which, wow, does that suck. <laughs> you know, apparently they have two guys. They have Plastic Man and Elongated Man in the DC Universe. And Elastigirl, too. Isn't that uh, the Incredibles? Is Elastigirl really part of DC as well? Mm -hmm. Huh, how did they get away with that on The Incredibles then? Nobody cares, I guess. I don't know. That's weird. Okay. Anyways, so this is a stretchy person. This is Mr. Fantastic. But his name is Elongated Man. You know, on Phineas and Ferb, <laughs> they did an episode where they had a superhero and then his the sister decided she was going to be a supervillain and she became the Danger Wrath. <laughs> <laughs> Which seems to me like that's what elongated man should be. Just a dude with a long neck or something. I don't know. The name just sucks. <laughs> it's so awful. And But this... he, he would have a great career in the adult film industry. Yeah, that's true. Any one of those characters would, I suppose. But Plastic Man is a good name. If they just took those two guys and made them get into an infinite crisis that combined them so that they just had plastic man but he wasn't annoying or whatever i mean i don't know maybe people love that plastic man is super annoying because people love deadpool so that would probably be the best of the of the worlds if they could somehow combine the two characters and elongated name man or <laughs> elongated man was named plastic man and then also they do this guy does battle with a bad guy whose name is Dr. Light. What a lame name is that? Seriously? Dr. Light? And how is he a bad guy? Shouldn't Dr. Light be the good guy? And Dr. Darkness is the bad guy? I mean, what, what the heck? I don't even know. I don't remember anything about Dr. Light other than basically he found out everybody's secret identity and that was the identity crisis. Cool. Well, uh, let me pose a question to you. The villain on Flash is reverse flash but before he was known as reverse flash he was known as professor zoom oh yes now what do you think of that name? professor zoom is pretty lame <laughs> you know and there's other guys kind of like that there's oh there's so many dc guys with bad names like on the the green arrow show they now have the other guy that does the arrows that was basically red but he's not red arrow well, he is in the comics now. But when he was a kid, he was Speedy. Yes, his name was Speedy. Um, that was when he was a teen sidekick, though. Doesn't it sound like a teen sidekick? I guess. Green Arrow and Speedy. <laughs> and famous for my ward, Speedy, is a junkie. That reminds me, though, in the golden age of comic books, there was a character like The Flash or like Quicksilver. I guess he was in Marvel, but what, what became Marvel in Timely Comics, and he was the Wizard. Oh, nice. <laughs> and dude, the Wizard is a terrible Well, they should have kept name. that around. If you could change his superpowers monkey, around, and uh, he could do other things really <laughs> fantastically. I don't know. <laughs> but the, the one that always comes to mind for me, and it, Marvel owns it. By, you know, and by owns it, I mean that you know they, they have embraced the lameness of this. But there was a guy who had a glue gun. He was a supervillain. He fought, I don't know, probably one of those lame characters like Daredevil with a glue gun and his name. Did he make crafts with it? No, he splurged <laughs> some guy with glue and his feet would be stuck to the ground. And he's like, ah, ha, ha, now I will rob the bank. And his name was Paste Pot Pete. Wow. And when Spider-Man would fight him, he was Spider-Man was defeated because he was laughing so hard at the guy's <laughs> name, Face Pot P. And eventually he had the guy is like, enough. And he changed his name to like something more formidable. But Spider-Man would never let him forget it. Anytime they see each other, he's just like, no, that's not your name. You are Paste Pot Pete. And I love that. It's one of those things where it's like, there's no shame at all. You know, Marvel is owning this. Paste Pot Pete is the stupidest name. Yeah. And we we are going to uh, let, shine the light on it, let everybody know. Yeah, which is 
I guess that's good that Mar. I mean, that's what I was saying that they needed to do on the Flash was they needed to own the fact that Bug Eyed Bandit sucked. They needed to say that name and then go, oh wait, no, I'm sorry, that sucks. Let me see if I can think of a better one. You know, that would have been awesome if they'd done that. And it's like what they did in Ant Man, where they're like, Ant Man, you know, can I change that name? Because it really doesn't sound very formidable. I mean, I might as well just call myself Pace Pot Pete. Well, in the only good Spider Man movie. Do, doesn't Ted Raimi suggest to Jameson that they call this guy Dr. Octopus and Jameson goes, terrible name. Um, and he starts to think up something else. Yeah. And then he says, you know, he's like, Dr. Strange. Oh, it's good, but it's taken. How about Dr. Octopus? And it's good when he came up with it. Right. Exactly. Yeah. They do do that in the only good Spider-Man movie. You disagree? <laughs> Anyway, I just, I, that kind of stuff is fun. There is a certain juvenile, what's the word I'm looking for? A hokiness to a lot of this stuff, to comic books, to superheroes, to, you know what I mean? It's just, they can't all be gray and grim and gritty and anything else that starts with GR. It's, there's stuff that's fun. Grod and, starts with GR. Grod does start with GR. And, and, <laughs> uh, and of course, he was CG in the episode. Uh, all, up, up till that point, he was a guy in a monkey suit. And then the episode called Grod. But anyway, that's uh, a com- complaint for another episode. Yeah. You know, like, like before Bullseye came along, Daredevil's arch nemesis was Stilt Man. <laughs> and it's that's a good one. stuff like that. It's, uh, there's a certain segment of the audience that's going to be like, oh, Stilt Man. And, you know, they'll get carpal tunnel for what they're doing with their hand. But <laughs> there's another segment of the audience that's like, well, no, nah, the guy in a world where people wear masks and talk to somebody with the same voice and that person suddenly doesn't know who they are and all that stuff. Stilt Man is fine. Yeah, Stilt Man. You know, you know you're lame if that's your nemesis, though, I have to admit. <laughs> you're just like, wait, oh, come on. Seriously, the worst guy I can fight is Stilt Man? Come on, well, why that sucky? Something you told me about, and I know we podcasted about it, though, but there was an episode you told me about of, of Ultimate Spider-Man they had all the monsters, the Marvel monsters, uh-huh. like Werewolf by Night and all that oh, stuff. Oh, right. Uh-huh. And when it ca- came time to present Man Thing, what did they call him? Oh, they didn't mention, yeah, because he like grew to a giant size, and they're like, it's time to be giant size Man Thing. And they showed like the logo. So it was just like, okay, this is a part of our history that people <laughs> mocked us for for a long time, and we're going to bring it right to the forefront. Giant-sized man thing. And it's just like the spider buggy, this little thing that they came up with in the 70s that everybody admitted was a total mistake to have the spider buggy. And But every once in a while, somebody will mention it again. You're like Johnny Storm will be just like, hey, Peter, what happened to that spider buggy you had? And he's like, oh. And maybe that's just the difference between me and somebody who loves, you know, my parents died and I cannot forget it, you know, is that these people have fun while they're out solving mysteries and, and, and defeating foes and, and all that stuff. And, and they have a circle of friends and it's fun when they get together, even to save the world, you know. Speaking of that kind of a thing, something as awful as the spider buggy. Mm hmm. There is Crypto the Superdog. Love Crypto the Superdog. Going on, there's what? The Super Cat? Shoot, I wanted to say Speedy, but it's not. It's Speedy not Speedy because that's Green Arrow's Green Arrow sidekick. You don't remember? I don't know. Well, I'll, the, the one we're building to is Beppo the Super Monkey. <laughs> but What was the horse's name? The Super Horse? It was like Comet or something like that, right? Let's find out. Okay, I'm looking him up. Hold you're on. Gonna, I, probably just do Superman Family or something like Superman that. Superman Family? Like any of those Silver Age, oh. Jimmy Olsen, Super, Superman's pal Jimmy Olsen, or Lois <laughs> Slane Superman's girlfriend covers are so hilarious. There's a... Li- the listing thing on the Legion of Super Pets. <laughs> okay. It is Streaky the Super Cat. Streaky. Who I mean, apparently likes to go streaking. Who doesn't? <laughs> and Crypto the Super Dog. Comet the Super Horse. I believe that's what I said. And Beppo the Super Monkey. <laughs> 
<laughs> you know how stupid that is? It's so stupid, I love it. You know what I mean? <laughs> You've read Hush, the uh -huh. Jeff Loeb, Jim Lee, fantastically successful miniseries that they did in, in Superman. Oh, I'm sorry, in Batman. And in that one, uh, Poison Ivy puts her, a spell on Superman and tries to get Superman to kill Batman, and she makes her escape. And when Batman finally frees Superman from the spell, He's like, you know, now how are we going to find Poison Ivy? And he's like, you know, she's gotten away. And even your superpowers can't get us to find her. And he says, I know somebody who can. And in the next panel, we have Crypto the Superdog. And he says, here, smell this. And he gives him a leaf. And Superdog just flies and they follow Crypto to where Poison Ivy is. And that's one of those things where this, like they embraced. And I thought it was <laughs> rad that we saw Crypto for the first time in like 15 years in comic books, we saw Crypto. Yeah, I remember that Crypto was in that. And I remember talking to my friend, the same guy who was loaning me these, because uh, he loaned me Hush as well. And uh, apparently that was a Jeff Loeb thing. Like he really loved this He loved this bringing old back this stuff. old Silver Age stuff. Yeah. And apparently DC had tried to bury all that stuff and it had, you know, done a infinite crisis 3.0 or whatever basically said okay all this crap is gone and now there's just this and of course jeff loeb was doing great stuff and being really successful and all of a sudden he's like i love this stuff and i'm bringing it all back and screw you guys <laughs> and, and when you're on top you can do that sort of thing one of the things that he did was he had calendar man come back after 40 years or something like that as a, a batman villain calendar man whose whole deal was he would do stuff based on you know what month it was and i mean so just, he would march all march long <laughs> just like it's now marched across the country okay but and people are following him like forrest gump it probably was something that lame when he was created in like the 40s but Loeb embraced it and he's just like yeah okay well he's a lesser batman villain and he poses no actual threat to batman but I'm going to see what fun I can have with him. Yeah, it's fun to be able to do that. I mean, you, I'm sure you've seen some of Batman the Brave and the Bold, which a lot of Batman fans despise because it embraces the old school style of Batman. And I know you very much hate the Adam West oh, Batman. Oh, I hate it with a burning fire of a thousand hells. Which is kind of along the same lines as this Batman the Brave and the Bold. It's the mm. old style where everything was a little bit goofy and a little bit ridiculous. But they embrace that. And one thing that I think is really fun with that show is they start out each show where Batman is doing kind of like a pre-credits adventure. And then, you know, after that, they'll get on to the real adventure and they'll bring in all sorts of characters. Like Plastic Man, right? Like Plastic Man, which, oh man, was he as annoying as you could ever believe in that. But you told me and everybody else who's seen that episode has told me how great Aquaman was on that show. Yeah. And I believe it. These characters wouldn't still exist if they, <laughs> if they didn't speak to people in some way, you know? Right. I, I think it's cool because they pulled out all sorts of characters from, you know, and, and they're ones, a lot of them are ones I remember from Super Friends days. And Super Friends, most people think, oh, that's the cheesiest crap ever. They're the Wonder Twins. Oh, my gosh. Oh, Wonder Twins are beyond <laughs> cheesy. Whatever the step lower than... The, whatever the step in between the Adam West Batman show and Super Cheesy, <laughs> that's what the Wonder Twins are. Yeah, but even these characters they'll bring back. They'll bring back... Like Gentleman Ghost. They'll bring back Apache Chief. They'll bring back... Uh, <laughs> Did they bring back a chat, I don't know. If they, I can't remember who all they brought back. The kids watched it a lot, uh, you know, like a year ago, but it's been a while since I've seen them now, so I don't remember. Fifteen years, actually. But... I think I do remember Plastic Man may have been in the episode with Gentleman Ghost. And they had some guy I'd never heard of. And he had, like, animal. He could turn into different animals or have their powers. Or I can't even remember what it was now. But I think it's cool when, they, when they'll... So there's obviously different styles. You can't have Christopher Nolan Batman dealing with Plastic Man. No. No, that would not work. Uh, it would be fun to see someone try, but it would end up being a, a sketch on YouTube. Or yeah, something. you have to, you know, pick what where you're going to go with it. But I think that, yeah, having that other side, it's cool. And you can say, like, Guardians of the Galaxy, for example, 
really kind of embrace that. Because when it comes down to it, Guardians of the Galaxy are pretty cheesy. Rocket Raccoon is a really bad idea. But they made it awesome. They didn't like, oh, okay, he wears a black mask and he kind of has like a tail. But other than that, he's, he's like a, a dude. I don't know, I mean, you've seen what they've done. I mean, look at what, like what they did with Electro or what they did with the Green Goblin in, in Spider-Man. What they did with the Rhino, etc., etc. You know, they, they're too afraid to just take it and do what it is. And yet they did that with the Guardians of the Galaxy, which took some real cojones to, uh, you know, put it out there on the line. And it's cool to see somebody willing to do that and to actually go for it. Like Batman Brave and the Bold was. I mean, they had bat might <laughs> on Batman <laughs> that, Brave and the Bold. That's going really far, though. I mean, you complain that Plastic Man is annoying. <laughs> I can't even imagine. I, who did they get to voice bat might? Wasn't know. he like somebody like Gilbert Godfrey or somebody like that? <laughs> or know, Paul Rubens? Or, they embraced that, too. Whoever you get to play bat might... Christopher Nolan would just hire Peter Dinklage to play somebody who, you know, is a serial murderer. <laughs> yeah, I know. That's what Batmite would be. Paul Rubens was Batmite. Okay. Pee Wee Herman himself. Cool that they will give you something like that. that. I think you and I agree. That's one of the reasons why The Flash is a good show. Is it's fun. And his powers are fun. He seems to enjoy running around. And some of the stuff they've done with the super speed... Has just been really, really cool. And there was an episode where he ran so hard that he ended up going back in time like a day. And he looks over and he sees himself from the day before. And he's just, oh my gosh, that sort of thing. You just get a smile on your face even describing it. Yeah, there was, there was some good stuff. There were some good episodes, especially recently that I really enjoyed. There was one point where I was like, that one was good. Let's do the next one. And usually I'm the voice of the family saying, hey, okay, with Flash, but let's watch Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. now, okay? Because we haven't seen that. Because all my family seem to like Flash better. So, uh... It's a fun show. It is, yeah, that's the thing. I think it, it's a fun show and it's really good for <laughs> younger folks. It's kind of like Smallville or something where it's more made for a teen audience, a younger audience. I, I, I guess. It seems like Flash is kind of... Except for nobody lines. is a teenager on the show. It, True. When they said that Barry was 24 in like the third episode or whatever, I was I did a spit take. I was like, wait, what? Never for a second did I get the impression he was in his mid-20s. I always assumed that he was just like right out of high school or something, but that's well, just me. Well, he's a forensic scientist for the police department. You'd at least have to have a degree for that, I right? guess, but Gwen <laughs> Stacy was like 13 years old and had her own department at Oscorp in that uh, Spider-Man movie. <laughs> anyway, I wanted to thank J.M. Perkins for writing a fun story. This was fun and it inspired us to talk about fun in superheroes or fun in comic book movies. And the, that word is, uh, you know, after a while, after uh, Dark Knight made a billion dollars. And dude, Dark Knight is not fun from beginning to end. Right. Everybody said, well, that's what we've got to do to be successful. And, that, and you've seen some just really wretched examples of taking that and applying that to things that should be fun. But like one of the movies that I really want to see, we've mentioned in this episode, is that Tomorrowland movie. That looks fun. It looks kind of magical and delightful. And it's like, hey, remember when you were a kid? Why don't you be a kid again for two hours this July? Here you go. <laughs> is, is it May? I, don't I think know it's the end of May. It'll be out before this episode is out. Uh, let's not let that happen. That'll be pretty hard. But let's okay. finish right now and, <laughs> and let people go their way and go see Tomorrowland if they'd like to. All right. So, yeah, everybody, go see Tomorrowland, and uh, we'll see you next time on the Doonstief Audio Fiction Magazine. And now it's time for a new segment on our show called Blatant Unabashed Self-Promotion. Uh... Okay. Whoa, did you I didn't even know he was here. Yeah, I forgot. He was he went for a smoke break when we first started. They and I think I just assumed break. he'd passed away while he was out. Assumed or hoped. <laughs> oh, you'll pay for that one. But yeah, he's still here. Okay, so good to see you, announcer man. Yeah, th thank you for coming in. Stick around. We might use you. Okay, we're not going to use you. You can take off. So we we have to plug something. Whose turn is it? It's the show's turn. How's that sound? Oh, it sounds like you know what we're going to plug. That's yeah. right. 
Well, I guess it's a your thing, though, when it comes down to it. This is a s- incentive. Man thing. Giant-sized mic. Yes, thing. it's your giant-sized man thing that we're going to plug. <laughs> Where are we going to plug it in? You know you like it. <laughs> Anyways, Rish Outfield wrote a story, and we did a production of it. And it is incentive episode number five. We're only on five? I think so, yeah. Oh, my Lord. Pitiful. But yeah, it's an episode that we recorded. Uh, We had a special guest with us that day. Yeah, we had a good time with this story. And if you would like to have it, the way the incentive episode works is everyone who donates to the show gets to have it. There's no minimum or maximum donation. We should make a maximum. No donating over uh, $20,000. Okay. I mean it. Absolutely not. If you donate over that amount, we will stop doing the show. That's right. We will, but we'll... if you hate the show and you would like us to stop doing the show, <laughs> you have your number right there. There you go. And also, if you donate 20000 we are not sending you that episode. I'm sorry. We told you no, and you did it anyway, oh, so you right. don't get it. So you've heard him there, folks. So it's like 19900 All right. <laughs> Anyways, so yeah, there's no uh, minimum. There is a maximum, turns out. And uh, yeah, anyone who donates to the show gets this. We'll post it, and we'll send you the link for it. It's a secret link. <laughs> and uh, yeah, you can listen to it. You can download it. You can do whatever you want with it, really. It's yours. You've earned it. Can they really do whatever they want with it? I mean, I wrote the story. I'd rather they not do whatever they want. They can even wipe their buttocks with it if they wanted to. I'm not sure how they'd go about it since it's a digital file, but they can. I guess they did pay for it, so they're free to wipe themselves with it. But just just keep in mind that, you know, I have feelings. And if you do wipe yourself with it, don't let me know. So, Rich Outfield, why don't you tell everybody just a tiny bit about this story that appears in this show? Yeah, it's called Last Call, and it's about an unsavory dude voiced by Big Anklevich who goes into a bar, and an old man is there, and he buys everyone around because he's going to die that night. And he tells this story of how he knows he's going to die that night. And, uh, and that's about it, I think. And hilarity does not ensue. I don't think hilarity ensued. Maybe I should have shined a little bit more light on the source material and had it (laughs) embrace my paste pot peatness of that story. But we'll do that on the next one. All right. So, yeah, there's a a whole episode of The Dune Steve you can only hear if you donate. So check it out by donating. Thank you, guys. And if you already donate, well, we're compiling, recompiling the list to make sure that we've got everybody and send, we'll be sending that story out to you. Thanks to those who do da- donate. Uh, thanks in advance to those who have now decided that they want to donate. I guess that's it for our plug it in. <laughs> it is, and, and unless there's a giant donation, you will hear from us again. That's right, we'll be back next time. And thanks again, Justin Charles, for saving our bacon. Yes, thanks to Justin Charles for producing the episode. For being there for us time and time again. And thanks to J.M. Perkins for another fine story. And uh, yeah, we'll be back with more next time. I'm Big Ankovich. And I'm Rich Outfield. And I'm an Ultraman. man. Thank you. <laughs> He's just standing there. It's kind of creepy. He's just waiting for a chance to insert himself. Hey, none of that. This is a PG-13 show. All right. Uh, your mountain is waiting, everybody. Get on your way. Yeah, why not? The Dune Steve is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. So you can give it to anyone, but you cannot change it or make money off it. Believe me, we know that from experience. Bring out the gimp. The end. Take two. Hooded, Gimp felt rather than heard the superhero's battle cry. Kung Pao Punch! In the shifting... Oh, sh- I should say that into a mic, shouldn't I? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, see, I don't know. Maybe I should move. <laughs> yeah, you want to... <laughs> can, you want to, can you grab that chair, maybe, and come off? Mm. Yeah, I can. Is I there can... another chair? Get it on that. 
Now I'm like a tiny little thing, right? I'm like the size yeah. of a shrimp. Are you really? I think at this point I am. Because a small voice squeaked later too, he says, so. Victor Wynn grumbled as he pulled off his sweaty gimp suit and stepped into civvy clothes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Let's see where do we go. Oh wait, let's do that. Do that again. This more phlegm this time. Just do it. You just more did more spitting. So I can lead in for Marshall. <laughs> Power King turned to him. Power King's electronic armor clicked into place to cover his face. His hypersonic crown spinning up to change. His hypersonic crown spinning up to charge his. Fuck. <laughs> Power King's electronic armor clicked into place to clo. Clo. Fuck. Sorry. <laughs> you did fine the first time. Yeah, you can start his. Power King already moving out of his office. When he reached the. Th when he reached the threshold, he turned back to the apprentices, repeated, "Just." You put an N in. Yeah, you said apprentices. That's not a, how do you say that? There is an <laughs> apprentices. It came out apprentices. Yeah, that sucks. <laughs> But Ryan had already scurried beneath a piece of fallen ceiling tile. <clears throat> but Ryan had already scurried beneath a. <clears throat> but Ryan had already scurried beneath a. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> it's the simplest word sometimes. It's just impossible. I don't know how to pronounce peace. What? Asked come. You it, you're screaming in miniaturized vert. Oh, well, that's right. I'm little guy now, huh? What? Asked Kung Pao Shrimp. <laughs> <laughs> it's not helping. Has he done other non-chemo stuff? Uh, you make me look this up. Well, you're going to have to look up the, about the author and the yes, author's yes, note anyway. Yes, yes. Admit it, you have no idea how to do a dune, Steve, after such a long break. I don't, yeah, it's been way too long. Uh, yes, that's I right. do recall that that was a big part of Dune Steve episodes, the burping on the mic. Yeah, I think you're right, yeah. I think we have a whole reel of us burping on the mic. It's been a long time since I added anything to that reel. It's been a long time since we've done an episode. It's been a long time since I wreck and rolled. And the town of Golden Showers. showers. <laughs> that was a chemo story as well. Oh, so, yeah. He's only so he's only done chemo stories chemo on story. our show. I don't know if he's done other stories elsewhere, but oh, I'm for sure us, he has. no. He's a real writer. Unlike me. I couldn't write my name in the snow. With a golden shower? Yeah. In a town full of it. Yeah. The story is called Field Exercise. We get to see a little bit about how some... Kids that are attending uh, Xavier's School for Gifted Children, you know, how, how they rise into adulthood. Do you really want to spoil the story that much? Oh, let, no. let, let's, let's let me that spoil out. the story by saying, the story kicks ass. Spoiler alert, guys. <laughs> Sorry. And if you think I should cut that out, I will as well. You could definitely cut my comment out, is what I'm saying. Because <laughs> I think I did spoil it too much. Okay, sorry, but we, that's something we can talk about afterward if you want. I say let's not spoil the three words on this one until the author's note. Is that okay? Okay, we can do that. Because one of them is Kung Pao Shrimp, right? Yeah, I think so. And one of them is Gimp. Is it? I'm, I'm fairly sure Yowza. Gimp was one of the words I put into the hat. Okay. Bring out the Gimp. The last one was... It wasn't a capybara, Power that's for sure. Man, Power King. Yeah, Shadow or something like that, probably. Penumbra. If we ever do this contest again... I'm going to make a rule that nobody can put in words like penumbra. Okay. How do you uh, define that <laughs> a little more? Uh... <laughs> that, that'll be one of the rules. We just have to write it down. No words like penumbra. Similar, I think, to some of the moments that they've got in the Ant-Man trailer, which I guess we'll have to see how it turns out. It's August something that comes out, right? I don't think so. I just think it's July now. Oh, yeah. is it? You know, after Guardians coming out in August, they're just like, hey, this could have played way earlier. And it could have. 
Guardians. So they did that with Ant Man. They moved it up to mid July. Yeah. Something else. Oh, the Fantastic Four opens in August too. So that might be the other reason why they moved it up to give yourself a little space. What else do we have for the rest of the summer? We've had Avengers already. I don't know. I mean, there's, there's that Batman Superman movie. one's not until next year, right? Right. Um, well, Tomorrowland is the only movie that I care about this summer, besides Avengers, and Avengers is done. Um, but there's the new Pixar movie. There's something called San Andreas with The Rock, which is an action movie. There's a Mission Impossible 5. What's the Pixar movie this year? Is Inside Out. Inside Out? Okay. I'll give that one a shot. Sad that I'm not as excited about Pixar as I used to be. Would you stop slurping on the mic? I, there's not any way around it. <laughs> Just learn how to drink a bottle. The bottle is the size of my urethra, man. I. Jeez. I think I may have even, I think Starship Sofa. Ooh, you. I don't think you could hear that, could you?